You're now tuned in to the Desire to Trade podcast, a show where we bring you the best figures of the trading world and teach you how you can become a successful trader. This is your host, Etienne Kret. What's up, traders? It's Kraki from the Desire to Trade. Now, if I were to ask you one book that probably all traders on this podcast recommended. What do you think that book would be? My guess is you would probably say Market Wizard and you would be right, totally right. And so today my guest for the podcast is none other than the author of Market Wizard, Mr. Jack Schwager. Jack is really an amazing person. He's been working on a lot of stuff these days. Now in this podcast, he shared a lot of advice from his book, but also his path as a trader and as a writer because he did a lot of stuff. Now, just a quick reminder, guys, if you want to check out the Facebook group, it's architecture.com forward slash group. You can join the Facebook group for free. And I really look forward to network with you there. Last thing, if you want to check out this architecture.com forward slash free, you can get a couple of free resources, again, totally free. So check this out. It's my pleasure to give you the, all that stuff. It's my pleasure to bring you the podcast. And I'm really thrilled about this interview. You'll see it's a great one. And I'll talk to you at the end. Today, I'm with a guest that I was super impatient to get in the podcast. I have to say I'm just amazed by his work and everything. His name is Mr. Jack Schwager. How are you doing, Jack? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. So I just want to say it's a pleasure again to have you on the podcast, to have you here. I think you're going to add a lot of value and you have a lot of projects you're working on right now. Uh, yeah, well, the main I have one uh, consuming project at the moment and it's not writing a book for a change. Um, it's, uh, it's a uh, tech startup called Funseeder and... Uh, Funseeders basically the mission is to establish a central website that uh, traders worldwide can link to through their brokers um, and have their track records verified because we get the data directly from from the brokers and they also have access to uh, all sorts of analytics. They're able to, for example, to generate as a starting point, you're able to generate or see your equity curve, which something that I've always wanted and it's not easily available. Brokers don't, don't provide it. And so the ability to see your trading on a day by day basis, I think is very helpful to be able to see the visual image. And on top of that, there's all sorts of analytics, which we can talk about. Um, that's the trader side. And of course we're not, and we don't charge for that. So, uh, you know, that, that's a loss, that's a loss leader, if you will. Um, we're not in the business of charity to traders, uh, although the site is a charity for traders. And in that respect, it's giving them a lot of stuff for nothing. But our uh, our motivation, our incentive, is that we have another company called Fundseeder Investments. And Fundseeder Investments uh, is uh, the chief client of Fundseeder Technologies. And using the this database of traders worldwide that we're building up, as a source for discovering undiscovered trading talent and using those traders to either uh, pick them for a, say, a fund of emerging managers that we, we are have in the works or structuring, uh, or for, to, in some cases, that they're particularly good to ultimately structure individual funds around them, uh, or to introduce them to uh, qualified investors seeking new trading talent. So that's the basic uh, project. And uh, it is essentially to disrupt the conventional Wall Street structure of just a few key uh, large institutions acting as the, uh, uh, the decision makers and uh, shepherders of, of trading talent and only a very, very few having access to that channel. And then chat and then directing the vast vast majority of money to a very established large asset managers so we're going the other direction we're trying to open it up to the to the world literally i mean anywhere it doesn't make a difference if you're you're in a, in a developed country or in eastern europe or in southeast asia or south america or africa or anywhere for that matter and if you uh, have an account and you have some ability to trade uh, this is a way to uh, let yourself be discovered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like this is really important for some people because this is really about 
allowing the public to to trade and be discovered, right? So right. I think it makes sense. Now I want to go and asking you what is one quote that inspires you. Well, um, probably if I, the single quote that pops into my mind, um, and and I I will preface this by saying. It's, I've also in talk said that if I was limited to give 10 words of advice to traders, that was my constraint. I could only use 10 words. It would be this quote, and the quote's from Bruce Governor, who founded Caxton and had an incredible trading career. And uh, he said to me, know where you're getting out uh, before you get in. And that is uh, sort of terrific trading advice because it does a couple of things. Well, first of all, if you follow that advice, uh, you automatically have a risk management plan uh, just by following that one sentence. But moreover, what, what that advice does, it, it lays out a way of eliminating emotionality from trading. Because where do so many traders go wrong, and myself included, is um, when you're in a trade uh, and you haven't made a decision, a hard decision of where you'll exit, there's all this turmoil, you know, particularly for positions going against you. Uh, do you throw in the towel? Do you give it more room? Uh, you'll get out and now that the market will turn. And uh, you know, there's all sorts of things that come into it. And emotions are not conducive to good trading. They're, they're in fact, you know, they're, they're a tremendous impediment. So if you instead are able to adapt that advice by saying every time you place an order, as which is my basic habit as far as trading positions go, not investments, but trading decisions, always placing a good little cancel stop when you enter that order, then you are making a decision in a clear-headed way because you, you don't have the position yet. You're not experiencing any emotional turmoil. You can think clearly where do I want to get out? Where? How much am I willing to risk on this trade? Where will I be wrong? And you make that decision and you enter where you want, you know, whether it's by market or by limit order, but linked to that is a good little cancel stop as, at where you decided to get out. Then, you know, the position goes against you. You don't have to deal with the emotions. You've already made your decision. Uh, you could raise that stop or bring it in tighter to reduce your risk at any point. I mean, of course, physically, you could do the opposite, but uh, that's not advisable because then you basically defeat the whole purpose, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's having a plan before you enter any trade, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's part of it. So a trade, a trade decision is not simply where to get in. A trade decision is both where to get in and where to get out. And if you only have half of that, you've got half of a, an effective trading plan. Mm -hmm. And I feel like traders focus only on one part sometimes, right? <laughs> uh, well, so yeah, traders say. mostly, uh, or particularly newer traders mm -hmm. or less, less experienced traders, certainly think that it's mostly about finding a brilliant strategy of, get, of how to get into trades or coming up with brilliant trade ideas. They think that's really what the key of being a great trader is. Uh, ironically, great traders will tell you that that is probably the least important part of it. The most important part is to uh, be able to manage the risk or preserve capital so that no single trade can do you undue damage and that your basic trading stake is never endangered. Uh, that is pro to, to be able to do that is the, is the most important element of successful trading. Now, that is not enough. Uh, you can have great money management if you have no no methodology and no edge in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't care how good your risk management is, you still can't make money that way. But uh, uh, unless you have those the risk management side, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to be successful. And um, and then, then, of course, you have to marry it to an approach that does have some sort of edge. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back a little bit in time because I want to hear how you started to trade exactly. Okay, yeah. So I I really knew nothing uh, about markets or virtually nothing, even though I have an economics degree, even though I have a graduate economics degree. Back back when I went to graduate school, 
there were no market courses um, of any type that I can recall. I don't, I don't believe there was any any market course that I can recall, um, even though I went to a top top university. But that just wasn't <laughs> that just wasn't part of the curriculum, and there certainly wasn't anything on futures, uh, which is the market I primarily became involved in. So um, I, I didn't, even though coming from an economics background, I really knew very little about trading markets, so to speak. I mean, I knew about markets, you know, in the supply demand sense, uh, but I didn't know about uh, trading in any way. And uh, I sort of fell into the job. I fell into trading via the, my first job. And my first job I was looking for uh, was not, I wasn't looking for a specific job. I was basically looking for a job that was analytical in nature coming out of graduate school. And one of the jobs uh, that I uh, actually, it was probably the only real job I interviewed for because I'd gone to an employment agency when I graduated. And uh, after about two weeks, uh, I didn't get anything back. And I sort of felt I should get a job immediately. I came from, uh, you know, I had a graduate degree from Brown University. I, you know, um, I kind of had the, you know, economics and math as a, you know, math as a minor. It's sort of like a sort of tailor-made, I thought, resume to get a job quickly and easily. Um, so when it took two weeks and I didn't get an interview uh, scheduled, I kind of took things into my own hands. And uh, at the time, the New York Times had a uh, had a section in, in next to Help Wanted, which was Positions Wanted. That was people putting in their own ads in the paper for looking for a job. And so I put in a I I, I, found the, I took the cheapest size ad, like a two line ad or whatever, and I think it cost me like fifteen dollars. And I put it, you know, I just put in my little educational background and looking looking for an analytical job. And and I got about I got about fifteen twenty calls. Only one of them was legitimate. All the others were uh, people who prey upon other people putting in position wanted ads and basically trying to get them to do chain type of selling, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, the type of thing where, you know, you uh, you get somebody to buy product from you and get them to sell to somebody else, that type of thing. Really, really sleazy stuff. Uh, but anyway, um, only one of these uh, calls was legitimate and it was from a... It was for, from a, from a uh, research director at a firm called Reynolds Securities, which subsequently was absorbed through other firms as Wall Street firms merged. And uh, they were looking for a, a research analyst. And basically, that's the job I ended up getting, uh, largely, I think, for the help of writing. They had the final candidates write uh, articles on the market, which the director, who was writing a column for Barron's, was using a source material for his weekly column. And so uh, I, I guess I was told later that I did a, I was kind of the one candidate that stood out on that. And that really helped me get the job, even though I had no experience at all or had no knowledge about markets. In fact, uh, when I was asked by the, by the research director in our interview, uh, what do you know about gold? I mean, and I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. What, what do you know about futures? And I said, really, not much. I mean, stuff like gold or whatever. And it was such a bad answer that I still remember to this day. But I got the job anyway because I must have had some things that, that went well. And I had the opportunity to write this uh, this article. And so uh, that's how I got into uh, being an analyst in the future. So once I became an analyst, uh, I really got intrigued by the whole game. Um, the the idea that you can do analysis on the market and then bet which way it's going and then see whether you're uh, verified or not, and there's a potential to make a lot of money if you're really good. And there's all sorts of things that I found really uh, uh, neat about it. And that's how I started trading. Of course, like most people, and in fact, probably like a lot of the people I interviewed, although my my ending was not the same as their ending, but um, as many as was true for many of them, I initially started out with repeated failures, always with very small amounts of money. Uh, but in the, in the beginning, I did everything totally wrong. And the only thing I did right in the beginning is that each time I tried trading, I began for a very small amount of money. Uh, and I always say to this day, if you're be new to trading, one of the pieces of advice I give is uh, whatever you do, start with a very small amount of money because you'll probably lose it and you might as well pay less for your trading education. <laughs> Good advice, yeah. Was your first analysis, the first article you wrote, was that accurate or...? 
interestingly enough, um, it's about about ten years later, I was moving and I was going through papers, and I came across this article. Now, know, know that I knew nothing about futures, and my time was the copper market. And I knew uh, nothing about copper, particular either. So um, I lived in uh, I lived in uh, uh, at the time I was still in Brooklyn, I think. Anyway, there was a big library there, the largest library in the borough called, called Grand Army Plaza. So it was this huge library, and we're talking well before internet days, you know, we're talking well before actually PC days. So you didn't have the luxury of just kind of Googling something. Uh, you really had to do a lot of legwork to get stuff. So I went to the library and, um, and I, you know, found anything I could that was written on copper. And it was like this thing called the American uh, Metal Bulletin, I think it was. I found uh, there was uh, McGraw-Hill had a metals, metals Weekly and the American Daily Market was a daily paper. And then I found some articles. And I literally lived in the library for about a week and just totally crash course educated myself on copper. And I knew at basic economics and uh, and I guess I always had some ability to write well. So um, I put it all together into an article. And I, now, that's like what got me the job. Then about 10 years later, I went back, you know, I was going for my papers. I found the article and I read it. And, you know, surprisingly, it was, it was actually... An, you always was reluctant to say something complimentary about your own writing, but but it was actually <laughs> remarkably good. You hmm. you know you could not tell from that article that the person who wrote it was not was somebody who really knew nothing about you know was brand new to the markets. It sounded like somebody who uh, who had experience and knew about the markets or whatever. And the basic conclusion was was essentially right. You know uh, more or less. I mean it was sort of. Uh, you know, it, it, it was with a sensible conclusion. So, um, yeah, it was it was actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. And how did you go from writing to trading then? Well, uh, trading, I should make clear, was never my my main endeavor. It still is not to this day. So, I, uh, you know, my basic day job started out for the first couple of years as being a research analyst. Two years into the business, that I, after being offered a twenty percent raise which basically put me even to salary to my secretary, I decided I could probably do better looking elsewhere. And in about uh, oh, in, day, in a few days, I had a job offer a triple the salary for being a research director at another firm. And so the next 20 plus years I spent as a research director. So again, that was not a trading job. So any trading I did was always like as a sideline. And uh, when later in later days, when... It, well, most of when I was writing the books, I was actually writing it in addition to my day job. And then later on, when I left Wall Street and uh, took certain points of time where, you know, where I was on my own doing different things, um, uh, then again, I was working on different projects and the trading was an aside, uh, never the main thing. And I spent 10 years as a, as a partner in a hedge fund advisory firm. Again, the trading was just a, a hobby occasionally because I was usually too busy to be trading. So, uh, you know, I've, I've done trading on and off for probably 40 years, but I never did it as a prime uh, primary occupation. Mm -hmm. Was that a reason? Was that because you had other passions or? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's exactly right. I mean, exactly that is one key reason. Uh, a lot, everybody thinks they want to be a trader, you know. <laughs> well, you know, in many cases, they don't want to be a trader. What they want to be is they want to be very successful. They want to make a lot of money. And um, I, I know enough to know that this is not true, but in many cases, they think it's an easy way to make a lot of money. Uh, so there's people have all sorts of reasons why they want to be traders, which have nothing to do for love of the actual art of trading. Uh, you no, know, I like trading. I like some aspects of trading. And there are other aspects of trading uh, I don't like. I mean, I, I particularly, you know, I try, I take steps to limit the emotionality. But I don't like the emotionality. I always think that the, the pain of losing is greater than the joy of winning. So uh, for me, there's an ace asymmetry built into trading. So even if I have a positive edge and uh, there's more wins than losses, but still the losses feel worse than the wins. You know, So they're not equal. Uh, I mean, that's an example of one reason I, I don't love trading. The other thing is I don't consider myself a particularly good trader. Uh, I only manage to be net profitable because I know enough, but not because I have any, any, any innate talent like many of the people I did interview. So I don't think trading is something that I 
particularly excel at. Uh, it's not something that I enjoy tremendously. I, I like it to some extent, but you know, I'll trade as long as I, you know, as long as I'm enjoying it and things are going all right. If, if things change, then I'll stop. So it's something I can take or leave. Uh, so to me, it's a secondary thing, and it's not my passion. Um, it's not the thing that I'm. It's not what I'm best at. I think a lot of people do gravitate to finding their passion in things that they excel at. And, uh, you know, so for me, I've probably, not probably, I've certainly put tremendous amounts more energy in writing lots of books, uh, uh, in giving hundreds of talks, because those are things I, A, I think I'm pretty pretty good at, and B, I enjoy it. And probably no accident. There's no accident that I enjoy it, because and that I'm good at it, I think. The first one is probably a prerequisite for the second, whereas trading is something that I think is 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 a is a nice game and uh, and I enjoy it at times, uh, but it's not a dominant thing in my life. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I think you've made a big impact with all your books and everything. So, how did that book writing came into play? When did that happen? Yeah, so the the very first book was not Market Wizards. Uh, mm -hmm. I think if you polled people who read my books and ask, uh, you know, what is what was Jack Schwager's first book? I, they, I think 90% plus would be pretty confident to tell you it was Market Wizards. Well, no, Market Wizards was the first book that was really a big seller. Um, but the first book I did was a strictly analytical book. And this is, goes back to 1983. And at the time, uh, you know, as I said, I was a research director on Wall Street uh, for the Futures Department. And I really didn't think there was anything, I didn't think there was a decent book written on the markets. And I knew I knew a fair amount at that point, you know, about a lot of things, fundamental analysis, technical analysis, um, you know, uh, trading and et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that uh, that I could do a better book than uh, anything that was out there. So it was really that type of I guess you, that's kind of sounds egotistical. Um, but to be honest, I mean, it was an egotistical motivation. I I literally believed that I could do a much better book on the futures markets than anything that was out there. And I said, well, I might as well be the one to do it. So uh, that was my objective. My objective was not to make money. My objective was not to uh, sell the most books. Uh, so my objective was really to write the best book I could, the best resource, the best reference work, uh, you know, well-written, hopefully, but still serious, a uh, serious analytical book. So that first book was called The Complete Guide to the Futures Markets. It ended up being about... Uh, you know, high 700 pages in length and, uh, you know, included a lot of stuff, uh, including some, you know, nothing. Uh, I was careful to not put anything in that couldn't be uh, absorbed uh, or read with understanding by anybody who was a high school graduate and at least knew algebra. So um, I, I, I mean, that was my level. However, you know, I, I did get into stuff like uh, statistics and regressions, and but I explained everything from the ground up. So I found I thought I was going to do one chapter on regression analysis. I ended up with a whole section of the book, six chapters, with the first chapter being a primer on statistics. And I found I couldn't everything. I, every time I wanted to write something, I couldn't do it because I couldn't assume the knowledge uh, uh, on the part of the reader. So I had to write this chapter, which was just an introductory uh, of some key concepts in statistics so I could then go and talk about regression analysis and people would know what the terms and what the thinking and what the logic was. So, uh, but again, I, I knew even then that the more equations you put into a book, the less books you'll sell. But that was not my objective. My objective was basically, like I say, to write the most comprehensive uh, worthwhile reference volume. And every now and then, I'll get somebody to tell me, Wow, that was my favorite. You know, I like the Market Wizards, but that was my favorite book. You know, and, and that book took a lot more work actually, uh, and I spent the, a sabbatical doing it. And this is pre PC, and uh, so I had to do everything by hand, including the the chart plots, and uh, I had to do regression analysis on the calculator and stuff like that. So it it really it was a full year of it. I mean, when I say a full year, I mean with lots of all nighters involved. Uh, so it was an intensive full year, and uh, and so that was the first. That, so that got me involved in writing, and that that book, uh, incidentally, is fine, is being updated, and uh, the I have a uh, co-author who's doing the legwork, uh, Mark Etzcorn, who's 
as I say, he's like the only person I trust that are doing the update. Uh, anyway, he's doing a great job on updating and we go back and forth. He does the update, sends me the chapters, and then we go, and I give him changes, and that's the way it's worked. So that book, the, so the original book will come out, in a, you know, now it's over 40 years old. Uh, uh, was it uh, thir- no? It's like uh, what is it? 1984 when it came out. So uh, it's it's uh, it's like 35, uh, 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 32 years old or whatever. So uh, it, it's sort of it is in need of updating, and uh, the updated version comes out later this year. Oh, so that's how I got. That is how I got involved in in um, in writing. And a few years later, I was approached by a publisher, another publisher who wanted me to do a whole series of analytical books. And I said, hey, I've been there. I did my one analytical book. I don't want to do any more. It turned out to be not the case, by the way. But uh, yeah. but at least I didn't believe I wanted to do any more. At least I didn't for that point in time. And um, I, I had this idea for Market Wizards for several years, but I was working a demanding full-time job. And just it's very easy not to write a book if you're – if you're working, you know, uh, till uh, eight o'clock every night. Uh, so uh, I never got around to doing it, but I had the idea of market wizards. And, and I mentioned it and dropped it. If I was doing anything, I'd do this. And he said, well, that's great. Why don't you do that? And that was a catalyst. And then you started to write the book? I, I did. I did it. Uh, well, I, I, I wasn't extraordinarily focused back in those days. Uh, you know, I'm, I can be focused even now, but... When I consider the fact that I was a director of research and I did did the book uh, at the same time, I, I'm not quite sure how I did it. Um, and um, but I, what I would do, I know how I did it. I mean, I basically did it by uh, on weekends, uh, just kind of being incredibly focused and working on the books, and uh, and, and on nights a lot of times. So uh, I probably didn't do sleep enough that year. And uh, I had to get into the zone, so to speak, where I was incredibly productive when I was focused on the book. Um, so uh, that's the way I did it, essentially. Mm-hmm. I'm just curious, how did you, how would you do that then? Is it just working on the book all the time when you have free time? or? Yeah, pretty much so. Yeah, the only, the only, the only time off I took and the one thing I didn't, I never compromised in my life, the one thing I won't compromise on is physical activity. So I was, I guess, well, running was my main, was my main activity. So um, that didn't change. I would still do, I would still do my runs, uh, I don't know, five, six, even seven times a week. And on weekends, they might be longer runs. Uh, so I always took time for that. But that time, it was actually productive because there were many cases where I might have been stymied um, while, you know, while working on a book on something. And then take a walk, uh, not take a walk, take a run. And uh, in my run, thinking about it, coming up with how to treat it. And so even though I took time off of that, in some ways, that might have been some of my produ- most productive hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I experienced that a lot. Yeah, I have to say with running and walking. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's true. I mean, I think that's a basic truth. I think because uh, you get into a certain state when you run or walk or do something of that nature that uh, you can you you can actually think much more clearly or in a different level or things can pop into your mind that wouldn't if you're sitting at a desk and uh, you know I, my advice to to writers who find they have writer's block is is go for a run or go for a walk and uh, I remember watching a, a Nova documentary on the mathematician who uh, who uh, uh, solved Fermi's last theorem and um, talking about how you know, when he ran into he had done all this work he thought he had it solved, and then it turned out there was a there was an error, and he had to redo every start start you know redo everything, and he could have tried to figure a way out, and it was on a walk where where the insight came to him, and I could really relate to that I really understood how that happens. Mm-hmm. And then how did you select the people for your book? Oh uh, well, the first Market Wizards book, uh, I knew some of the people. Um, Michael Marcus, who was the chapter one of the first book, was actually the analyst who, whose position I took. I replaced Michael. He was leaving to become a uh, trader, and that's why that uh, analyst position was open. And we talked as I was coming in and he was going out, then we stayed in touch. And years later, 
uh, when I was doing the book, he had, he actually had gone on to become a phenomenal trader, and I asked him to participate, and then uh, he actually was a source for Ed Sakota, and uh, I also, through uh, again, linking through him, uh, he ended up being the reason I ended up uh, going to Commodities Corp for, for a while, and then Commodities Corp, through Commodities Corp, I knew Bruce Kovner. Uh Bruce Kovner was uh, was hired by Michael Marcus originally, so uh, so I knew a number of the traders that way. Uh, I knew of other people just by some of them were visible. Not very many of the people I interviewed, but some like Michael Steinhardt or Jim Rogers or whatever. So uh, I asked them because they you know they were just like recognized as being sort of top top uh, traders or. Uh, hedge fund managers of the day. And then I just did uh, networking. And then last, I, I did just like, just net, uh, trying to search any any uh, any databases or anything else I could. But pretty much that's, that's uh, all of those, all of those sources were ways I came up with people. Hmm. And what are the lessons you got from that first market wizard? Well, basically the whole book. <laughs> I mean, literally, the the book is 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 nothing but lessons. And uh, at the end of each of the Marker Wizard books, I do well. First, at so the end of every chapter, uh, my 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 standard format is at the ev- end of every chapter, I spend a few pages talking about what I think the basic lessons out of that interview were. And then at the end of the book, I do kind of a list of all the key uh, uh, insights or lessons from all you know from all the chapters. And I've done that process now for four different books. So there's tons of them, and the books are really all about the lessons. And um, whether it's something, you know, we talked, for example, we, we talked about one right in the beginning when you asked me what my uh, favorite quote was. And sort of that's an, that's an example of a lesson. Uh, and um, and there's, you know, there's all sorts of lessons that, that, that come through. Uh, there are things, some things that are, uh, people have heard before. Uh, so let's just take something like discipline, right? So yeah, discipline. I I write that discipline is part of the uh, is an important key to being a good trader. Well, people, well, I've heard that before. They don't pay much attention to it. One thing I do is is to always try to get the stories from traders. So you know, uh, I'll get a, a trader where a momentary or a single lapse of discipline led to a god awful result. And that that story then sort of makes it much more stark in getting the lessons of discipline across to uh, to a reader. In that, you know, here's a guy who's always disciplined. One time he let it go, and this is what happened, and the story is memorable. So even if it's a lesson that uh, people have heard before or know, uh, getting a story attached to it makes it much more visceral uh, and therefore memorable. Um, then there are lessons. There are all sorts of lessons that uh, that are, you just don't get anywhere else. They're just not part of the lore. Uh, for example, Marty Schwartz in his interview had a line which was, "If you're ever really, really worried about a position, and the market, particularly over the weekend, and the market lets you out easily, don't get out." And uh, that was a really creative, insightful type of piece of advice about trading, which you don't hear or see anywhere else, or I never heard or saw anywhere else, and sort of came out of the interviews. And interestingly enough, uh, it turns out there's other traders that I interviewed who were telling me some of their most memorable experiences, which are usually of the painful variety, um, (laughs) actually demonstrated that particular lesson. In fact, the best example of that of, of Schwartz's principle of not getting out when the market lets you off the hook easily came in that I, I recall off the top of my head came in my interview with Bill Lipschitz who was a uh, currency and currency options trader and at the time was with Solomon and uh, had a position had a three billion that's B with a that's billion you know a B um, three billion dollar position uh, it started going against him, and he didn't have the liquidity to get out. And it tells a story where, when you look at the end result, you realize the way he got out of that, and 
without too much damage was really by following Schwartz's advice, not that he knew Schwartz's advice, but the same, inherently he had the same instinct, which was not to get out of the market, let you out easily. And in this particular case, he was trapped in a, in a horrible position late Friday, couldn't get out, uh, tried to force the market the other way, only dug the hole deeper, and was resolved to just take the loss on Sunday, but then the market let him off the hook. And the rest of the story has to do with what he did and how he eventually got out. So that's another. That's an example of a, of a lesson where uh, something you don't hear all the time. Mm -hmm. I think what I what I really got from your book is that all traders are different, right? They don't have one way of doing things. They're really like really different in their styles of trading. That is exactly if you were if uh, if there was one lesson that somebody should pull out of my books. Uh, that is the most important one, or the, or if they don't get that, then they've missed it all, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is absolutely essential, and it comes up time and time again. I can't tell you in how many interviews I had people say, "Well, I tried trading traders, but it didn't work because my approach didn't fit their personality," or lines like, "Every successful trader I knew found an approach that fit them," and it comes up again and again and again, and. This is one of those basic market truths, and it's one of the first things everyone needs to understand is a total prerequisite to be successful. If you do not do this, you almost cannot be successful as a trader. And this is finding an approach that fits who you are, what you are, what you're comfortable with, uh, and so on. And... From that, that's the reason why if you try to follow somebody else's approach uh, or somebody else's advice or uh, copy somebody else, it just doesn't work. You almost invariably will end badly. And you're absolutely right to bring that out. That is really a absolutely core essential lesson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is really important for people to, to get it. Because... For most people, it's really tempting and really easy to copy other people, other traders, right? Well, yeah, when that's what people want to do. Uh, people want it served on a tr uh, want trading success served on a silver tray. Uh, so I always find it interesting. Uh, you know, every every couple of years or so, I may go onto Amazon and look at the you know reviews, just you know, just out of curiosity. Uh, and I remember one and the reviews. I mean, last time I looked a year or so ago, whatever it was, or two. Uh, they, I don't know, it's like 95% of the reviews are positive. But there's always, you know, you always get the cup of, just a couple of one or two star ones. And so sort of how do you get like, just like all, almost everybody reads it, gives it five stars, and some give it four stars, whatever. And then you have a few people who are not at like three, they're like at one. And, and, and the reason, that, and almost usually the, 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 the reason is because the comment will be something like this. Uh, this book is just a waste of time. He didn't tell, give you any any exact way, uh, any formula or uh, you know system on how to beat the market. It's like, you know, unless I told them, you know, uh, uh, you you get in every time the 50 day crosses the 200 day. If the RSI is at this level, and uh, and you uh, liquidate your, your your positions every Friday, and you know, I don't know, whatever. Uh, unless I gave them like a cookbook of instructions that they just had to do uh, without thinking and that would work sort of and make them millionaires, they were unhappy. And the irony is these same people, I'm sure, buy the books that purport to do that and they're happy. But of course, I'm positive that, that they don't get anything out of it. But uh, but at least they're getting a, a, a method they don't have to think about and can just follow blindly. Uh, however, anybody who is successful in the markets knows that is absolutely not the way to do it. Yeah, that's so true. So let me ask you, what is your trading style then? Oh, my trading style. Okay. So my trading style is, first thing, let me just say, is totally irrelevant to anybody listening to this. So you should, it should be, if anything, merely a curiosity, but anything I say should be, should be totally irrelevant to you because uh, your particular natural in inclinations may be totally and are probably quite different than they could be totally different. But what my particular trading style, and it has evolved. So uh, I started out as a pure fundamentalist. I'm now a pure technician. Uh, there was a point in my career where 
I thought um, that I wanted to be purely systematic to remove emotions, but I subsequently discovered that I had a problem with that because to be purely systematic, you must follow the system. And that means sometimes taking losses where you don't know really how large the loss is because you don't know exactly where the system will give you the reverse, the reversal. Um, and I didn't like that bit of lack of control. Uh, so ultimately, I gravitated to discretionary, uh, purely technical trading, uh, which is when I trade, you know, like I'm trading now, that's what I do. And so my style is, well, first of all, to differentiate between investments and uh, trading. So for example, when the markets were in complete panic and crashing in, in 2000, late 2008, um, I thought the, my, my, my basic thought was, hey, this is probably one of those times where there's just too much, too much uh, panic in the markets and long term, this will probably be a reasonable buying point. So in, you know, in late 88, I, I put on, started buying stuff like long term leaps in calls on emerging markets and metals and, uh, and stuff like that, where I had basically a limited loss because there were calls. I had plenty of time because there were leaps. And I was putting them on it when, after markets had crashed a lot. Those type of trades, there's no exit point. There's nothing. It's just basically, I think, it's probably a good investment. And uh, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. You know, that's basically, so that's, that's totally different. Uh, but that's not real trading. I mean, in a way, the timing element of it is maybe. But uh, it's not trading in the sense of managing a position. And um, for trading, my basic style is to work off charts, uh, pick points where I think the market will move in a given direction up or down. Now, that point may be a point that will uh, be consistent with a trend and sort of be looking for an extension of a trend. Or, or it could be uh, a counter trend trade. It could be, well, that's a point where the market, you know, I expect there should be significant resistance because of several factors. And it seems like a reasonable point to look for the market to stall. And I'm willing to take a counter trend trade. What they both have in common in both cases, those they'll both have, as we talked about earlier, a stop of where to get out, which is why I can go counter trend because I'm determining what the risk is before I go in. Of, of a, if you don't do that, then counter trend could be particularly dangerous because the market can just keep going against you. I guess it can in trend trading true. Uh, but so, so my own approach boils down to when it's a trading type position to uh, pick a spot based on charts, could be trend or counter trend in its in its uh, conception, and uh, to have a risk management point associated with the trade from the point of implementation. So that is that in a nutshell is my style. Sounds pretty simple. It sounds that's good. Like you master it as well, so that's good. Well, it fit, like I say, it fits it fits me, and sort of and and uh, you know it's it's comfortable. If I don't do that, if I just have positions on and I don't have the stops in and I'm just like have them on, then I find I actually can wake up early because I'm, oh, I got all these positions on. I'm worried what the markets are doing. And especially since I live out West, I'm still sleeping when the markets uh, are in their main session. So uh, um, basically, at least this way, I don't find myself waking up think, thinking about positions. I've, I've already made my exit decisions and uh, it'll take care of itself. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit more about your project and how can people find you? Okay, so uh, they can find they can find uh, uh, Fund Cedar. It's just like it sounds. The word fund, F-U-N-D, and Cedar, one word, S-E-E-D-E-R. So Fund Cedar is one word. Uh, dot com, and uh, there that that landing page will give them all sorts of information. There'll be a little video that'll explain the concept. Uh, and as I said, the concept is to provide traders worldwide to access free analytics and generate equity curves with the intention of uh, and create verified track records with the intention of our being able to find these traders. And um, and it's also something that traders who uh, think they can manage money and don't have any access. And that includes really virtually most traders who think they can manage money. Uh, don't have the access and connections to get capital. Uh, if they're good, this is a way to prove it and uh, have the potential 
to be chosen to uh, get allocations. And uh, again, any allocations would not come from Fundseeder Technologies, which is the Fundseeder.com site, but they would come from our sister company, Fundseeder Investments. And so again, if you to get information, just go straight to Fundseeder.com. Sounds interesting. And what's your main motivation for the future? Motivation? I don't know. I kind of do what I what I want to do. Uh, mm -hmm. My motivations aren't only work oriented. Uh, hey, we before we started this broadcast, I mentioned I'm in I'm in Boulder, Colorado, and that's by choice because I'm sort of outdoor oriented. Uh, this puts me close to mountains. I uh, love doing hiking. I love cross country skiing. So. Uh, part of part of my motivation is to just enjoy life and do that type of stuff, and uh, and then uh, my I obviously have a motivation with this company FunSeater.com, which I should add is I am just one of the partners. I I am not the founding partner, or I am one of the founding partners, but I'm not the primary founder, who is Emmanuel Bellari, whose idea this was. Uh, but uh, certainly, my from a work standpoint, my big objective is to make this a help make this a successful company and uh, you know i think if, if fundseeder.com catches on and traders become aware of it uh, it could become a significant force if the idea i think is powerful and if uh, my hope my objective for fundseeder is that a few years from now anybody who's a trader will know hey if you're a serious trader you know you should get your account on to fundseeder.com uh, you can see how you rank compared to other traders you can get the analytics and uh, you get an opportunity possibly to be found and manage money. Uh, actually, for that matter, one of the things I plan to do a couple of years out is to do a book uh, called Undiscovered Market Wizards, from which I will draw the candidates from people we actually discovered through the website. So <laughs> there's actually even the potential for somebody, to, somebody who's really talented on trading to uh, get notoriety uh, and be included in a future Market Wizards book. That would be awesome. <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. So, Jack, I just want to remind the listeners that all the show notes are going to be on disartotrade.com. So if people want to find the links we talked about, if they want to find you, they can just go on disartotrade.com. They'll find everything there. And, Jack, I think we touched on this a little bit before, but I want to ask you, if you had to give only one piece of advice for traders, what would that one piece of advice be? Well, I said we did talk about it. And I said like the favorite quote from Carpenter about getting out, knowing we get out before you get in. Yeah. Uh, and the second piece of advice you actually brought up is you have to know what your what your uh, what your approach is. Find find something that fits your personality. Uh, and we talked about the need for risk managers. So we talked about some of the very. If you know, we're talking about one piece, uh, it would have to be come from that from those three because those without those three, it's it, you can't be successful. And and it's hard to pick, you know, what would be one more because there's so many, so many, many others. Uh, but the, those which we've talked about are really uh, all very essential. So this is basically combining the advice from every trader, basically. Yeah. I like that. So Jack Schwager, thanks a lot for being on the Starship Podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you here. I'm super glad we did this interview. It took a little bit of time, but I'm super happy about it. Well, hopefully, and, wait, hopefully it was worth waiting for. So. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Okay. And for all the listeners, I'll see you in the next episode. All right, guys, so how was that? I hope you liked the interview. If you guys want to join me after the show, check out thisr2trade.com, thisr2trade.com, all in letters, forward slash group, and you'll be redirected to the Facebook group right away. So it's really a good way to network, to connect with me, to get all the stuff I'm doing, and to be aware of everything I'm going to put out in the future. So check this out. And last thing, check out the blog. I just released the Disarted Trade Academy. This is a great way to develop the skills you need as a trader. So this is all on DisartedTrade.com, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Again, I'll leave you with some music from my friend Daniel Hossford. Check him out also at TheDannyBoyExperience.com. <laughs>